Well, a very good morning to everybody. Um, thank you for being with us this morning on Resurrection Sunday. This, like we've said so far, this is one of the most special events in the church calendar, um, and we're excited to, to share it together. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Pastor Nate has read a little bit of this passage so far. Luke chapter 24. And for our time together this morning, um, we're going to be looking at three main points from Luke chapter 24. And then I'm going to give us four application points. Um, hopefully these are really applicable actions that we can um, apply to our lives out of the, the resurrection story this morning. Um, and then we'll close. So let's, let's jump right in and firstly look at Jesus' resurrection. Um, and let's read again from um, Luke 24, starting in verse 1 to verse 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. There's some really key events um, in this resurrection account. And the first one is the woman going to the tomb. This takes place on the first day of the week, um, which is Sunday. If you remember, if you, were, if you did join us on Friday um, for our Good Friday service, you remember how Pastor Nate took us through the week. And now we've got to, we've had Good Friday and now we're on the Sunday, the, the first day of the week. And by this point, Jesus' body was almost certainly starting to decompose um, in the tomb. And the women go with these, these spices and they want to go and embalm him and to really pay their last respects to him. And this is really the woman's act of love. But it's also the act of unbelief. And it's evidence that they didn't understand Jesus' words, that he was one day going to rise from the dead. But with these spices in hand, they go to the tomb. And as they arrive at the tomb, um, if you remember from the, the, re the resurrection account, or even from the, the burial account, this was a wealthy man's tomb. Um, it belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, and one of the key characteristics of uh, a wealthy man's tomb was this removable stone. Um, if you see here in the cutaway, there was this stone that would roll across the entrance. Now, this was a characteristic of a wealthier man's tomb, and it enabled them to seal off the tomb um, once the burial had taken place, and then perhaps open it at a later stage, either to put somebody else in the tomb or to rearrange the bones in, in the tomb. So when the women arrive at the tomb, they see that this stone has been rolled away. And now this is way too early in the burial process for this to have happened. And when they look in, they sort of stoop in. You can see that there's a, a small opening, that doorway. As they stoop in, they see that his body isn't lying there. Now, either it's been stolen or something else has happened. Put yourself in the woman's shoes. Can you imagine the shock of finding this empty tomb? Okay, they've just come off of a very traumatic week. They've seen everything that's happened to Jesus. They've been involved in all these events that have taken place and finally seen him killed. And now, as they're going to pay their last respects to Jesus, they find that his body is gone. That must have been really disturbing for them. And if that's not enough, as they're there, two angels appear to them and the, the women then fall on their faces, and it's a sign of this, their fear and their respect for these angels. And then the angels start to question the woman, but they also remind them 
of Jesus' words. Read in Luke 24, verse 5. And as they were frightened and bowing their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. So there's that, that questioning, first of all. Then in verse 7, or, sorry, in the, in the middle of verse 6, Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. Now the angels reminding Jesus, or reminding the woman of Jesus' words is really key, because for a time, and for a long time since, a lot of people believed that Jesus' body had been stolen, possibly by the disciples. But this wasn't a criminal act. This was a God-ordained, eternally planned event that would mark all of history. And during his ministry, Jesus had proclaimed his full knowledge of these future events, and he had also been telling them key parts of the gospel um, that before it had even happened, really, those, those key events. If we look at Jesus' words in, in Luke 24, or the, the angel's words um, in Luke 24, verse 5 to 8 that we've just read, and we look at Paul's summary of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, we see that there's a very clear um, link. There's several key components. Firstly, we see a reference to the crucifixion. We hear that the angel said, or in, in Jesus' ministry, he said that he's going to have to go and be crucified. And then in Paul's gospel, he said, in Paul's um, account, he says that Jesus was crucified. Then, by implication, because he died, he was buried. Paul also said that he was buried. And then Jesus said that after three days, I'm going to rise again. And that's, why the, the, that's one of the things that the woman didn't believe. And then Paul acknowledges that Jesus, after three days, did rise from the grave. What's the woman's response to the angels questioning them and, and talking to them about these things? It says that they were perplexed. But then they also remembered Jesus' words. Those are their, really, their two responses. They were perplexed and they remembered Jesus' words. One commentator suggests that when the angels were talking to the woman, they brought together the woman's recollection of all the events that they had witnessed during that week and then also Jesus' words that he had spoken to them during his public ministry. So something happened at that when the angels appeared to them that, that linked those two. But the woman was still perplexed. And I think this is a, their response indicates that they don't, they don't quite believe yet. But something is slowly happening. Then the next event in, in the resurrection um, account that we've read is that the woman then rush off, and they, they're bursting to tell the others about what's happened, and they rush off to, to tell the 11 disciples. But notice the disciples' response here. They viewed it as nonsense or as an idle tale. Now, perhaps this was partly because they were women coming to tell them, but it was also almost certainly just the unbelievable nature of this. I mean, who'd ever heard of somebody rising from the dead? And now these women are coming and telling them this nonsense. I mean, what, what are they talking about? But, and, and that's, that's evidence of their unbelief at this point. But for one man, Peter, he doesn't just dismiss this. He takes off and he goes to the tomb and he wants to find out exactly what's happened. He wants to see for himself. He's, he's heard these things, but he, he's not going to trust anyone. He's off to the tomb and he's going to decide for himself. And as he gets there, he stoops into the tomb and he sees it exactly as the woman had said. And based on, the, on seeing the empty linen cloths and the stone rolled away, he leaves the tomb marveling, marveling at what's just happened and, and marveling at what this could all mean. But even this, I think, is, is also evidence that he doesn't quite believe just yet. But some, some very important things are, are starting to happen. Before we go on, um, I just want to stop and consider one thing. When the angels appeared to Mary, they said that Jesus' not being there was just as he had told them. In other words, it was to be expected and it was a fulfillment of what Jesus had said would happen. And earlier on in Jesus' public ministry, um, he had begun to tell his disciples that what was going to happen and that it was necessary for him to go and die. And through each of the gospel accounts, we read... Uh, a statement or Jesus' words, something like this. 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So the, the, immediate, events, the immediate events that the women are experiencing is a fulfillment of this. But this fulfillment goes way back beyond just Jesus' public ministry. It goes all the way back to the beginning of time. For example, in Genesis 3.15, talking about this, this future event that will one day happen that would really conquer um, the, this event that Satan had put in place and to the this, this sin that had entered into the world. In Genesis 3.15, Moses records, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, talking about Christ, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And then later, if we go all the way into around the middle of our Bibles in Psalms, one of the psalmist writes, talking about how God isn't going to keep Jesus dead, but he's going to do something else. He says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus had full knowledge of his mission and what it entailed right from the beginning. And all of history had been building up to this point. So it was a, a marvelous, miraculous moment that these women were experiencing that was unfolding right before them. And very soon, Jesus was going to start physically appearing to several people. Let's look at three of those this morning. Jesus' appearances. Now, if you read through the gospel accounts, um, chances are that you're going to see that each account is told from a slightly different perspective. Some of the gospels record events that others don't. Um, so when we read all of them and we, we really put them together, then we get a much better idea of um, the events that occurred that day. So if you're holding your place in Luke 24, um, go to John chapter 20, verse 11. John chapter 20, verse 11. And here we read how Jesus appears to Mary. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have lain him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that that he had said these things to her. So Jesus appears to Mary um, Magdalene in the garden. It's a very, very intimate and personal account. But then later on the same day, he appears to two people on the road to Emmaus. So let's go back to to Luke 24 and continue reading from verse 13. Luke 24, verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all these things, it is now the third day since these things happened. 
Moreover, some, of the, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were went, some of those, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, "O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory?" And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then the account goes on to say how Jesus was continuing walking with them and he pretended like he was going to carry on. And they said, no, 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 Jesus, it's late. Um, oh, they didn't know it was Jesus at that time. They said to him, it, it's late, come, come and stay with us. So Jesus goes and he stays with the, these two and he, he has a supper with them. And as he's giving thanks for the, this meal, the disciple, the, these two, um, their eyes are opened and they recognize who Jesus is. And at that moment, Jesus vanishes. But they recognized who Jesus was. And after walking and talking with Jesus, um, Jesus opened their eyes and their hearts to who he is. That he was the one who was crucified to redeem people from their sin. Now, we're not necessarily sure how they, they realized that this was Jesus. Perhaps they, they recognized his act of, of giving thanks for the food. Maybe they had seen him do this at, at the feeding of the 5,000 or um, perhaps even heard the account of the, the Last Supper. Or maybe as he was giving thanks, they saw the piercings in his hands. Regardless of how this was revealed to him, revealed to them, they realized who Jesus was. And the, the realization of who he is results in them wanting to just, this, this urgency to go and tell others. And they hurry off to recount the events to the eleven. We should imitate their response. Because just like the, those two disciples, you and I have seen Jesus through the gospel. But yet we, we somehow seem to have become numb to it. And we don't necessarily have that same urgency to, to go and tell others about what we know and what we've seen through the Gospels. So this Easter time, um, even what's left of this weekend, let's keep reminding ourselves of the Gospel. Just marveling afresh at who Jesus is and what he's done. And just be burning inside of us to want to share that with others around us during this, this time. Then thirdly, um, the last appearance that we'll look at um, is in verse 36, Luke 24, verse 36, where Jesus appears to the eleven. So as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought, he saw, and thought they saw a spirit or a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Notice the progression here um, with Jesus talking to the disciples and there's a lot of similarities to him, his interaction with the two on the road to Emmaus. Firstly, those who he's talking to, they don't believe just yet. But then they, they interact with him. In the disciples' case here, um, they, they touched Jesus, they saw him, and then they watched him eat. And then after that, Jesus opens their minds and their hearts to understand the scriptures and to see what was said about him in all of the Old Testament. Now, while you and I don't have Jesus sitting with us personally and explaining the scriptures to us and um, even having this, this very personal interaction, in some ways, we have more than that. 
because we have the completed canon of Scripture printed for us and digitally for many of us in our pockets every day. And if we've trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, then we can understand the Scriptures and apply it to our lives through the Spirit. So if Jesus has appeared to us through the Scriptures, then we have a responsibility to get to know Jesus better by spending time in the Scriptures and being faithful to, to spend time reading the Bible and trusting and relying on the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. And when we do that, the Spirit works in us to grow us and to develop us. And this is amazing. This is something that, that I've been thinking a lot about this week and even in the last two weeks, that when he does that, the Spirit is revealing who Jesus is through what we're reading. He's revealing who Jesus is, but then he's making us more like him. In other words, Jesus is working through the Spirit to transform us to look like Jesus. It's, a, it's an amazing, even a bit of a mystery on as how that whole interaction and, and that transformation takes place. But all of that is, is linked to the Word. So those are, are three of Jesus' appearances um, on, the, on the Resurrection Sunday. And then our third point, let's look at Jesus' charge. So at this point, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to several groups of people, and he's also fulfilled multiple scriptures across the Old Testament. And in doing this, he's really brought a, an age to an end. He's, he's had a mission from the Father, and now he has completed it. But as he's completing this mission, he's also now transitioning to a new mission, one that would change hands from Jesus to his followers. And this new chapter involved Jesus leaving being bodily with his disciples and now charging his disciples and, and empowering his disciples to continue the work that he started. But before we look at this charge, it's very important that this new mission that Jesus gives his disciples is it entirely dependent on and it's made possible by the resurrection. It's only because that Jesus rose again that he could that we can really move on to this new chapter, this, this new era. Because of Jesus' victorious power over death, he could give his disciples this charge. Read with me the last few verses um, from verse 46 in Luke 24. So after he's opened their minds to understand the scriptures, he says to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am standing the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now this is a, an echo of a very familiar passage to many of us in Matthew 28, um, verse 19 and 20, and if we look at that passage in particular, um, and comparing it with this one we've just read, there's really three parts to it. There's a command that is to make disciples. But then there's an activity linked to that, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. It's that continuing on of that work that Jesus started with his disciples. But there's a promise as well. I am with you to the end. Jesus is not leaving us to do this entirely by ourselves and, and really just saying, okay, you do this in your strength and I'm going to leave you and I'll, I'll come back and see how you do. No, he's there with us very intimately um, being with us and empowering us every single day of, that, of this mission. So while Jesus gave this charge to his disciples um, just before he ascended, it extends to us, his disciples today. If you've believed the gospel and that you've trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, then this command is for you too. So with that in mind, Let's look at, at four application actions, um, and then we'll close. Firstly, respond. Respond. We live, believe it or not, in a very privileged time. We have the entire completed canon of Scripture at our fingertips. 
all of Scripture is complete, and we have the full account of how God orchestrated all of history to send a son from, and to, to save mankind um, from our sins. God has fully revealed this truth to us in his word. I believe that's true. We at Mount Mew believe that's true. Do you? Do you believe who Jesus says he is and what he's revealed to us through his word? You see, every person here needs to make their own decision on whether they believe that Jesus came to die for your sins and that he rose again after three days. Because we've all sinned, and our greatest need is for a Savior who can save us from our sins, something that we can't do ourselves. In 1 John uh, chapter 1, in verse 8 and 9, First John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, and this is the, the good news of the resurrection, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is the only remedy to our sin problem. And the rest of our lives on this earth and for all eternity depend on what we decide about who Jesus is. So the first action is to, to respond, decide who Jesus is. And then based on that, we need to repent. Once you've decided what you believe about Jesus, was he telling the truth? Or was he just a, a good man whose good works died along with him? Once you've decided that, and depending on what you decide, the rest of your life is going to follow a pattern. And I seriously hope that you have decided to follow Jesus and to believe in his completed work for you. And if you've done that, then our lives need to change. We need to change from satisfying our sinful cravings to living for Jesus. And it's this turning away from what we used to do and turning towards living for Jesus and living in a way that, um, that satisfies him and that obeys his commands that's what the Bible calls repentance. And part of this repentance is also changing who we're trusting in. See, before Jesus, we're trusting in ourselves and our own strength to, to somehow be good people or to just go through life and, and do it by our own strength. But after Jesus, we realize that we can't do this alone. We need him. We need the Spirit working inside of us to help us to grow and to look more like Jesus and to just live in a way that pleases him. We can't do anything without Jesus. But, and hear me carefully, we can do everything because of Jesus. And this, this act of turning away from our sins and turning towards Jesus is not just a once-off event that happens at conversion, but this is something that the Spirit works in us to do every single day. So keep repenting. Thirdly, rise up. Rise up. After Jesus' resurrection, he spent time with people explaining the Scriptures and how he had fulfilled them. You see, as we've already looked at, an understanding of Jesus and his word are the foundation for growing in Christ and maturing to look more like him. There's a lot of things that we can discuss here, and it, it's something that I've become increasingly um, passionate and interested in, in discovering more. What, what does this growing to look like Christ look like? So next week, um, as, we, as even I'm interested in this, and I hope to be sharing it with you, um, I'm going to be leading us through a four-part series on the fruit of the Spirit. And hopefully we just get to understand what, what these fruits of the Spirit are and to look at them as a measure for our maturity in Christ. But for the purpose of this morning, um, I just want to remind you that God's Word is central in our lives. We cannot grow or mature without it. Yes, this growth is slow and often inconsistent, but this slow transformation throughout our lives characterizes every believer. In 1 John 3 verse 6, John says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. 
No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a scary verse. But it's also a very clear gauge for where you are in your life. Yes, we all sin. We are all capable of falling. But a true Christian doesn't live in a habit of sin. We cannot. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We've trusted Jesus. Our lives have been changed. So, just a, a simple application question for ourselves this morning is, is the Word a priority in your life? If the Word is so central in our lives and, and is really our key for how we grow and look to mature in Christ, is it a priority in your life? Now, I'm not just talking about reading it, but applying it. Seeing changes in your life based on how the Spirit is applying it in your life. If you have a bulletin with you this morning, on the back there's a, a, a few blanks. Take a minute now just to think, even in the last week or perhaps the last month, is there a way that the Spirit has used the Word recently to change a behavior or a thought or a practice in your life? Just take a minute now and just think about that and jot it down and, and be encouraged if that is the case, that the Spirit is working in you and changing you to look, make you look more like Christ. Then our last point, number four, restart. We've just come off of a five-part mission series, and I think you would all agree that we've heard the very desperate need that still exists in the world around us. One of our missionaries shared these statistics with us, that it's estimated there are about 17,400 um, people groups in the world, and of those, 7,400 could still be unreached. They don't know the gospel. They've never heard the gospel. Now, to put that in population, we're looking at about 3.2 billion people. That's a big need. After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to many people, and he gave them this charge to spread this good news of what he had come to do. And he commanded them to make disciples. We were reminded last week that the charge is as we are going to make disciples. This isn't just a task that we leave up to full-time missionaries, those that we've heard from over the last few weeks, but it's something that each believer is tasked with and should prioritize in our lives. And again, the encouragement is that while this is aimed at us and we should be doing this and prioritizing us, we are not alone. The Spirit is with us. Christ promises to be with us until he comes again. Mount of you, there's a world full of people who need Christ. But how can they call on the one they've not believed in? How will they believe in the one whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone telling them? If you can find a, another space on your bulletin, I want you to think of one person in your life who doesn't know Christ and write their name down. Chances are, you can think of many more than just one. Is it possible that the Lord has placed you in their lives for a very specific purpose? Maybe that is the start of your mission field. So think about and pray about that name that you've written down. So in closing, what is the message of Easter? Jesus died for the sins of the world, he was buried, he rose again after three days, and he appeared to many people, and he charges us to go and to spread this good news to those around us. And it's up to each person working, walking this earth to decide if what Jesus said and did is true, and then to follow that decision by repenting from their sins and following Jesus. Then the rest of our lives should be characterized by rising up, growing to look more like Jesus.
and telling others about the wonderful free gift of salvation that is available through Jesus as we are going about this life. Pray with me as we close. Heavenly Father, what a joyous Sunday to be able to celebrate together, to be reminded of all that you've done for us. Thank you for this marvelous gift of grace, this immense sacrifice in sending Jesus to die for us, for taking on our sins and being the the penalty and the sacrifice that none of us could ever pay. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not become numb to the, the facts of the gospel, but even during the season to continually remind ourselves of it, to not only be, be thankful for all that you've done for us, but to continually repent, knowing that we, we always fall short of the standard that you, that you have set, but that it's through Jesus that you can look on us and, and be, be glad. Lord, thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together now. And I pray that as we go out um, to our workplaces this, later this week, um, even to our families, that you would help us to, to have the gospel on the tips of our tongues, ready to share with those around us and, and continually to make disciples for your glory. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.